Right. So, as we all know, breast is best. Breast milk is the best uh, nutrition for infants. Breastfeeding has been associated with lower risk of respiratory and gastrointestinal infections, obesity and diabetes, and possibly allergies. We still need further clarification of this. And these data, mainly epidemiological data, suggest involvement of breast milk specific components and the protection for this. If we now look at the gross composition of breast milk, we see that water makes up most of it. And then if we look at the macro and micronutrients, HMOs is the third largest component of the breast milk, making up five to 15 grams per liter of breast milk. Here you can see the major structures, beginning with 2FL, all the way around to LNNT, are the top 10 HMOs in breast milk. There are over 130 structures that have been described, and the top 15, as pictured here, make up the bulk, over 80% of the HMOs. And most HMO are generally present in, uh, generally not present in farmed animal milks. If we now look at the composition, you can see here that the structures or the contents are broken down to protein, fat, lactose and oligosaccharides. If we look at cow's milk, we see that we've only got a very small proportion of prebiotics, as presented here, very small. If we go along to human breast milk, we're up to that five to 15 grams per liter of the human milk oligosaccharides. And you can see that we have a large variety of different structures that are present here in the breast milk. If we look at the legend down here, you can see the different monosaccharides that make up the milk oligosaccharides. And the key will tell you the position of the structure of these. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a couple of slides. So if we look at the main categories of human milk components, of course we've got the nutritive components of breast milk, the lactose, proteins and fat that are digested and they're there for the nutritive value. They support healthy growth and development of the infant. If we look at the bioactive components, of which some of these are also bioactive components, but if we focus on the HMOs, these are not digested by the infant, they have no nutri nutritive value, they're there mainly to support the gut microbiota that we heard about in yesterday's session. And the key function is to support the appropriate immune education in early life. So if we focus a little bit more on the structures of those uh, human milk oligosaccharides, again, we have the monosaccharides that they're made up of over here. And if you look at every single one of these structures, they have one specific backbone of lactose, which is here. And then each one of these within the mammary gland is decorated with different specific monosaccharides to make up the diversity that we see in the HMOs here. And again, we have the linkage that gives us part of the name. So if we focus on 2FL, for example, you can see that we've got a linkage too with the fructose present here. Then if we go up to the LNNT, we have the lactose backbone, and then we move through to the N-acetylglucosamine, as well as the D-galactose on that one. So we've got a wide variety of different structures in the HMOs. And then if we compare them to GOS or FOS, you can clearly see that these structures are different. And one of the really intriguing things about HMOs is the structural similarity to the glycans that we can find in the body. So if we look at the picture here, you can see that it's a, a piece of small intestine and the finger-like structures of the villi poking out into the lumen. The green through here is the mucus that has been stained. And if we look at the glycans or the oligosaccharides that are present in this mucus, you can see the structural similarity to the HMOs. And that gives us a little bit of a hint about why HMOs could be important because of the structural similarity and the way that it can interact with pathogens and provide protection against infection. We don't have much time to talk today, so I'm, in this one slide I'm going to give you a brief summary of a large body of data. But basically what we know is that HMO act indirectly through the microbiota for colonisation resistance and to educate the developing immune system. If we look at the structures here, they can promote a bifid-dominant microbiome. 
They can act directly on the pathogens, just like the mucus can. They can act on the host epithelial cells and immune cells. To prevent the pathogen growth, pathogen adhesion, reducing an inflammatory response, and aiding the mucosal barrier function. And you can imagine that this interaction right at the start of life is really important to educate the immune system to get it right and have a healthy life. Now if we briefly take a look at a bit of data, what we can see here is infants who've been fed a formula containing those two HMOs, 2FL and LNNT, and they have a lower risk for infectious illness and related medication use. So you can see for bronchitis here in the light green, there is the number of infants who have bronchitis in the absence of HMOs, and you can see this marked reduction in the bronchitis occurrence in infants who receive formula with HMOs. And here is our risk ratio, that big reduction. Again, if we look at antibiotic use, you can see this is the number of infants who did not receive HMOs, and you can see a marked reduction in those infants who did receive HMOs as denoted by the risk ratio here. Now, because HMOs are not digested by the infant, they're there for our gut microbiota, what happens to the gut microbiota? And if we look at formula-fed infants and we compare them to those who have the HMOs versus those that don't, the typical gut microbiota community at three months has two times higher risk to require antibiotics during the first year of life. So if we break this down into what we call fecal community types, these are coded here as A, sorry, A, B, and C. You can see that a breastfed infant, majority of the microbiota is A. If we look at the control fed without HMOs, the majority is C. And if we look at the infants who receive the HMOs, you can see that there's more of the fecal community type B compared to the control. And this is really important because if we look, you can see those with a faecal community type C have a higher proportion of infections compared to those, uh, sorry, antibiotics compared to those who have faecal community type B. And if we investigate that a little bit further, what we see is the infants that have the most benefit are those who were born by caesarean section. So here we're looking at the odds ratio of those infants for the same thing, the lower respiratory tract illnesses and the bronchitis. You can see the vaginal born infants here, there are, all infants are here, and the C-section born infants, you can see the reduction is bigger in those infants born by C-section. And if we look at the control microbiota, you can clearly see the changes here in the different types of microbiota is biggest to be seen between the caesarean and the vaginal born in all types here. And if we see the test formula, we don't see that difference between the caesarean born and the vaginal born, suggesting that we're having an effect on the microbiota as well. So in conclusion, HMOs are the third largest solid component of human breast milk, and they're different from other prebiotics like GOS and FOS. 2FL is the most abundant HMO, and LNNT belongs to the 10 most abundant HMOs. From the randomised clinical trials that I just showed you with individually manufactured HMOs, we have confirmed their safety, digestive tolerance and protective properties, supporting a role for HMO in immune protection, and this has been shown to be primarily related to lower respiratory tract infectious morbidity and antibiotic use, in part through their effect on the early gut microbiome, maturation and activity. Thank you very much.